Physiognomonica by Aristotle. Translated by Thomas Loveday and Edward Forster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. Preface This work, as we have it, is evidently a compilation of two treatises, the second beginning with chapter four. Neither is Aristotle's. Both may be peripatetic. Prantl's text, bracket, Toibna, 1881, close bracket, has been used, but a great many emendations have been taken from Forster's text, and notes in his Scriptores Physiognomonici, brackets, 1893, volume 1. On Forster's excellent work we have chiefly relied J. B. Porta's De Humana Physiognomonia, brackets, 1650, has also proved very useful. We have, as before, to thank Mr. W. D. Ross for his kind advice and suggestions. After some hesitation, we decided to use the less clumsy forms, physiognomy, physiognomic, in place of the more accurate, physiognomony, physiognomonic. Thomas Loveday, Edward Forster. Contents Chapter 1. Methods 2. Sources of Signs 3. Signs of Different Characters 4. Body and Soul Method Again 5. Typical Animals 6. Inferences Chiefly from Animals Physiognomonica Chapter 1 Mental character is not independent of and unaffected by bodily processes, but is conditioned by the state of the body, and, contrarywise, the body is sympathetically influenced by affections of the soul. The former of these propositions is well exemplified by drunkenness and sickness where altered bodily conditions produce obvious mental modifications, and the second by the emotions of love and fear, and by states of pleasure and pain. But still better instances of the fundamental connection of body and soul, and their very extensive interaction, may be found in the normal products of nature. There never was an animal with the form of one kind and the mental character of another. The soul and body appropriate to the same kind always go together, and this shows that a specific body involves a specific mental character. Moreover, experts on the lower animals are always able to judge of character by bodily form. It is thus that a horseman chooses his horse or a sportsman his dogs. Now, supposing all this to be true, and it always is true, physiognomy must be practicable. Three methods have been essayed in the past, each having had its special adherence. 1. The first method took as the basis for physiognomic inferences the various genera of animals, positing for each genus a peculiar animal form, and, consequently, upon this, a peculiar mental character, and then assuming that if a man resembles such and such a genus in form, he will resemble it also in soul. 2. Those who adopted the second method proceeded in the same way, except that they did not draw their inferences from all kinds of animals, but confined themselves to human beings. They distinguished various races of men, exempli gratia, Egyptian, 
Thracian, Scythian, by differences of appearance and of character, and drew their signs of character from these races, just as others did from animal genera. 3. The third method took as its basis the characteristic facial expressions which are observed to accompany different conditions of mind, such as anger, fear, erotic excitement, and all the other passions. All these methods are possible, and others as well. The selection of signs may be made in diverse ways. The last mentioned method, by itself, however, is defective in more than one respect. For one thing, the same facial expression may belong to different characters. The brave and the impudent, for example, look alike, though their characters are far asunder. Besides, a man may at times wear an expression which is not normally his. For instance, a morose person will now and again spend an enjoyable day and assume a cheerful countenance, whilst a naturally cheerful man, if he be distressed, will change his expression accordingly. And, thirdly, the number of inferences that can be drawn from facial expression alone is small. As to arguments from beasts, the selection of signs is made on wrong principles. Suppose you have passed in review one by one the forms of all the different kinds of animals. You still have no right to assert that a man who resembles a given kind in body will resemble it in soul also. In the first place, speaking broadly, you will never find this complete likeness, but only a resemblance. Moreover, very few signs are peculiar to individual genera. Most of them are common to more than one kind, and of what use is resemblance in a common attribute? A man will resemble a lion, let us say, neither more nor less than a deer. For we have a right to suppose that common signs indicate common mental characters, and peculiar signs peculiar characters. Thus the physiognomist will not get any clear evidence from common signs, but is he any better off if he takes every genus by itself and selects signs that are peculiar to each? Surely not, for he cannot tell what they are signs of. They ought to be signs of peculiar characteristics, but we have no right to assume that there are any mental characteristics peculiar to the different kinds of animals that we examine in physiognomy. Courage is not confined to the lion, but is found in many other creatures, nor timidity to the hare, but it shares this quality with numberless other creatures. Thus, it is equally fruitless to select the common and the peculiar features, and we must abandon the attempt to proceed by an examination of every kind of animal singly. Rather, we ought to select our signs from all animals that have some mental affection in common. For instance, when investigating the external marks of courage, we ought to collect all brave animals, and then to inquire what sort of affections are natural to all of them, but absent in all other animals. For, if we were to select this or that as the signs of courage in the animals chosen in such a way as not to exclude the possibility of the presence in all these animals of some other mental affection, we should not be able to tell whether our selected marks were really signs of courage or of this other character. Two conditions must be fulfilled, therefore. The animals from which we choose our signs must be as numerous as possible, and they must not have any mental affection in common except that one of which we are investigating the signs. Permanent bodily signs 
will indicate permanent mental qualities. But what about those that come and go? How can they be true signs if the mental character does not also come and go? No doubt, if you took a transitory sign to be permanent, it might be true once in a way. But still, it would be worthless because it would not be a constant concomitant of a particular state of soul. Then again, there are affections of soul whose occurrence produces no change in the bodily marks on which the physiognomist relies, and they will not provide his art with recognizable signs. Thus, as regards opinions or scientific knowledge, you cannot recognize a doctor or a musician, for the fact of having acquired a piece of knowledge will not have produced any alteration in the bodily signs on which physiognomy relies. Chapter 2 We must now determine the special province of physiognomy, for the range of its application is limited, and the sources from which its various kind of data are drawn, and then we may proceed to a detailed exposition of the more convincing among its conclusions. Physiognomy has for its province, as the name implies, all natural affections of mental content, and also such acquired affections as, on their occurrence, modify the external signs which physiognomists interpret. I will explain later what kinds of acquired characters are meant, but now I will give a list, a complete list, of the sources from which physiognomic signs are drawn. They are these, movements, gestures of the body, color, characteristic facial expression, the growth of the hair, the smoothness of the skin, the voice, condition of the flesh, the parts of the body, and the build of the body as a whole. Such is the list that physiognomists always give of the sources in which they find their signs. Had this list been obscure or insignificant, there would have been no use in my going any further. But as things are, it may be worth while to give a more detailed description of the more convincing of the inferences that they draw from their material and to state what their various signs are, and where they are supposed to be found, so far as I have not already done so. A brilliant complexion indicates a hot, sanguine temper, whilst a pale, pink complexion signifies naturally good parts, when it occurs on a smooth skin. Soft hair indicates cowardice, and coarse hair, courage. This inference is based on observation of the whole animal kingdom. The most timid of animals are deer, hares, and sheep, and they have the softest coats, whilst the lion and wild boar are bravest, and have the coarsest coats. Precisely the same holds good of birds, for it is the rule that birds with coarse plumage are brave, and those with soft plumage timid, particular instances being the cock and the quail. And again, among the different races of mankind, the same combination of qualities may be observed, the inhabitants of the north being brave and coarse-haired, whilst southern peoples are cowardly and have soft hair. A thick growth of hair about the belly signifies loquacity, on the evidence of the whole tribe of birds, for the one is a bodily and the other a mental property peculiar to birds. When the flesh is hard and constitutionally firm, it indicates dullness of sense. When smooth, it indicates naturally good parts combined 
with instability of character, except when smooth flesh goes with a strong frame and powerful extremities. Lethargic movements are a sign of a soft character, rapid movements of a fervid temper. As to the voice, when deep and full, it is a sign of courage, when high-pitched and languid, of cowardice. Gesture and the varieties of facial expression are interpreted by their affinity to different emotions. If, for instance, when disagreeably affected, a man takes on the look which normally characterizes an angry person, irascibility is signified. Males are bigger and stronger than females of the same kind, and their extremities are stronger and sleeker and firmer and capable of more perfect performance of all functions. But inferences drawn from the parts of the body are less secure than those based on facial expression of character and movements and gesture. In general, it is silly to rely on a single sign. You will have more reason for confidence in your conclusions when you find several signs all pointing one way. Here I may mention a possible method of physiognomy which has never yet been tried. Suppose, exempligratia, that irascibility and morose sulkiness necessarily involve an envious disposition, and that the physiognomist could, without any bodily signs of the last character, deduce its presence from the presence of the other characters. We should then have a method peculiarly appropriate to masters of philosophy, since it is, we suppose, the peculiar mark of philosophy when certain premises are given to know the necessary conclusion. But this method, which considers the interrelations of mental affections and that which proceeds by empirical observation of animals, sometimes arrive at contrary conclusions. Take the voice, for example. By the former method, you might feel bound to connect a shrill voice with a fierce temper, because in vexation and anger one's voice tends to become loud and shrill, whilst placid people speak in tones at once languid and deep. But, as against this, if you observe beasts, you find that a deep voice goes with courage, and a shrill voice with timidity. As witness, on the one hand, the roar of lion and bull, the hound's bay, and the deep-noted crow of high-spirited cocks, and on the other the high-pitched tones of deer and hares. Yet perhaps, even in these cases, it is better not to connect courage and cowardice with the pitch of the voice, but rather with its intensity, so that it is strength of voice that marks the brave, and a languid and feeble voice the coward. It is safest, however, to refrain from all positive assertion when you find that your signs are inconsistent and contrary to one another in detail, unless they belong two classes, some of which you have determined to be more trustworthy than others. Above all, it is best to base your arguments upon assertions about species, and not about entire genera, for the species more nearly resemble the individual, and it is with individuals that physiognomy is concerned. For in physiognomy we try to infer from bodily signs the character of this or that particular person, and not the characters of the whole human race. Chapter 3. Signs of courage are coarse hair, an upright carriage of the body, size and strength of bones, sides and extremities, the belly broad and flat, shoulder blades broad and set well apart, neither too closely nor 
too loosely knit, a sturdy neck, not very fleshy, a chest well covered with flesh and broad, flat hips, the thickness of the calf low down the leg, gleaming eyes neither wide and staring nor yet mere slits and not glistening, the body of a brilliant hue, a forehead straight and lean, not large and neither quite smooth, nor yet a mass of wrinkles. Signs of cowardice are a small growth of soft hair, the figure stooping and lacking in quickness, the thickness of the calf high up the leg, a sallow complexion, weak blinking eyes, weak extremities, little legs and hands long and delicate, loins small and weak, a rigid gesture of the body, with undecided, deprecating, scared movements and a shifty, downcast look. Good natural parts are indicated by rather moist and tender flesh, not exactly firm nor yet extremely fat, by leanness of the shoulders, neck, face, and neighboring regions, by shoulder blades closely knit and the parts below slack, by supple sides, a somewhat gaunt back, a clear pinkish hue over the body, a thin skin, a small growth of hair, neither very coarse nor very black, and moist, gleaming eyes. Dullness of sense is indicated when the back of the neck and the legs are fleshy and stiffly fitted and knitted, the hip joint round, the shoulder blades high set, the forehead big, round and fleshy, the eyes pale and vacant, the legs thick and fleshy and round at the ankles, the jaws big and fleshy, loins fleshy, legs long, neck thick set, the face fleshy and rather long, the manner of movement, gesture, and facial expression of the dull man, you may take it, are analogous to his character. Impudence is signified by small, bright, wide-open eyes with heavy bloodshot lids, slightly bulging, high shoulder blades, a carriage of the body not erect but crouched slightly forwards quickness of movement, a reddish hue over the body with a sanguine complexion, a round face and high chest. Signs of good moral character are a slow gait, a slow way of speaking with a breath-like and weak voice, small eyes, black but not lustrous, not open and staring, nor yet mere slits, with a slow, blinking movement of the lids, for rapid blinking signifies either cowardice or a hot temperament. Good spirits are indicated by a good-sized forehead, fleshy and smooth, the region of the eyes rather low, a rather drowsy-looking countenance, neither keen nor reflective, the gait, we may suppose, will be slow and languid, the gesture and facial expression those of a good but not a quick man. Signs of low spirits are lean and wrinkled brows, enfeebled eyes, but you should notice that weak eyes may signify softness and effeminacy as well as dejection and low spirits a meek bearing and weary gait. The pathic is weak-eyed and knock-kneed. His head hangs on his right shoulder, 
his hands are carried upturned and flabbily, and as he walks he either wags his loins or else holds them rigid by an effort, and he casts a furtive gaze around, for all the world like Dionysius the sophist. Sulkiness is indicated by a snarling grin, a black complexion and withered skin, a gaunt, wrinkled face, and the neighboring regions furrowed with lines, and by straight black hair. Men of fierce temper bear themselves erect, are broad about the ribs, and move with an easy gait. Their bodies are of a reddish hue, their shoulder blades set well apart, large and broad, their extremities large and powerful. They are smooth about the chest and groin. They have great beards, and the hair of the head starts low down with a vigorous growth. Those of a gentle disposition are robust-looking, well covered with plenty of moist flesh, well-sized men and well-proportioned, carrying themselves with head thrown back and their hair starts rather higher up on the head than is usual. The sly man is fat about the face, with wrinkles round his eyes, and he wears a drowsy expression. The small-minded have small limbs and small, delicate, lean bodies, small eyes and small faces, just like a Corinthian or Leucadian. Men addicted to gaming and dancing have short arms like weasels. Railers have the upper lip updrawn and the lower projecting, and their hue is reddish. The compassionate are delicate, pale, and lustrous eyed. The top of their nostrils is furrowed with lines, and they are always weeping. Such men are fond of women and beget female children, and in character they are erotic and mindful of the past, with good natural parts and a fervid temper. The signs of these qualities have already been mentioned. Compassion goes with wisdom, with cowardice, and with good moral character. Hardness of heart with stupidity and effrontery. Gluttony is indicated when the distance from navel to chest is greater than that from chest to neck. Lasciviousness is indicated by a pale complexion, a heavy growth of straight, thick, black hair over the body, a heavy growth of straight hair on the temples, and small, lustrous, lewd eyes. In the somnolent the upper parts are disproportionately large. Such men are bulky and hot, and their flesh is firm. Loquacity is indicated by disproportionate size of the upper parts, with a round, delicate build, and a thick growth of hair about the belly. A good memory is signified when the upper parts are disproportionately small and are delicate and tolerably well covered with flesh. Chapter 4 Soul and body, as it seems to me, are affected sympathetically by one another. On the one hand, an alteration of the state of the soul produces an alteration in the form of the body, and, contrarywise, an alteration in bodily form produces an alteration in the state of soul. Grief and joy, to take an instance, are states of the soul, and every one knows that grief involves a gloomy and a joy a cheerful countenance. Now, if it were the case that the external expression persisted after the soul had got rid of these emotions, 
we might still say that soul and body are in sympathy. But their sympathetic changes would not be entirely concomitant. As a matter of fact, however, it is obvious that every modification of the one involves a modification of the other. The best instance of this is to be found in manic insanity. Mania, it is generally allowed, is a condition of the soul. Yet doctors cure it partly by administering purgative drugs to the body, partly by prescribing, besides these, certain courses of diet. Thus the result of proper treatment of the body is that they succeed, and that too simultaneously, not only in altering the physical condition, but also in curing the soul of mania. And the fact that the changes are simultaneous proves that the sympathetic modifications of body and soul are thoroughly concomitant. It is equally indisputable that differences in the soul's capacities are represented by corresponding physical traits, so that all the resemblances in animals are indicative of some identity. Again, if we consider the behavior of animals, we find that some affections of the soul are peculiar to particular genera, whilst others are common to several and that the peculiar activities are accompanied by peculiar, the common by common physical traits. Examples of common characters are insolence, which is found in all animals with bushy tails, and violent sexual excitability, which is found alike in asses and in dogs, whilst, on the other hand, railing is a character peculiar to dogs, and insensibility to pain is peculiar to the ass. I have already explained how common and peculiar characters are to be distinguished. At the same time, it is only by long and wide experience that one can hope for oneself to attain detailed and expert understanding of these matters. For not only are visible characteristics of the body to be referred for explanation, as we are told, to analogies drawn partly from animals, partly from modes of action, but there are other external traits which depend on the varying proportions of bodily heat and cold. And, to add to the difficulty, some of these traits are very much alike and have not got distinctive names as is the case, exempli gratia, with the paleness that results from terror and the paleness due to fatigue. Now, when the difference is so slight, it can hardly be discerned except by those whom practice has taught to appreciate the congruity of different shades of expression with different conditions of mind. And so the argument from congruity leads to the quickest and soundest conclusions, and enables us to distinguish minute differences. It is a method generally useful, and particularly in the selection of physiognomic signs, for the sign selected must be congruous with what they stand for. Deduction also should be used in the selection of signs whenever possible. In the deductive procedure, we attach to our data known attributes of them. For instance, if we have it given that a man is an impudent blackguard and penurious, we can add that he will be a thief and a miser, the one as a consequence of his effrontery, the other as a consequence of his penuriousness. In all such cases we ought to include the deductive method in our procedure. Chapter 5. I will now first attempt to make a division of animals by the marks in which they are bound to differ if they are respectively brave or timorous, upright or dishonest. We have to divide the whole animal kingdom for this purpose into two physical types, male and female, 
and to show what mental attributes are congruous with each of these types. In all beasts that we try to breed, the female is tamer and gentler in disposition than the male, less powerful, more easily reared, and more manageable. One may conclude from this that the female has a less spirited temper, and I think we find a parallel to this in ourselves. For when we are mastered by a fit of temper, we become more obstinate and totally intractable. We grow headstrong and violent, and do whatever our temper impels us to do. Further, the female is, in my opinion, more mischievous than the male, and, though feebler, more reckless. Everyone can see that this is so in women and in domesticated animals, and, according to the unanimous evidence of herdsmen and hunters, it is no less true of the beasts of the field. Moreover, it is beyond dispute that in every genus the head of the female is smaller than that of the male, her visage narrower, her neck thinner, her chest weaker, her sides of smaller build, and that, whilst her hips and thighs are fuller, she inclines to be knock-kneed, the lower parts of her legs are less stout, and her feet more delicately made. In short, the build of her body is pleasing to the eye rather than imposing, and she is in comparison feeble and tender and of moister tissue. The male is the opposite of all this. His is the braver and more upright nature, whilst the female is the more timid and less upright. This being so, the lion manifestly exhibits the male type in its most perfect form. He has a good-sized mouth. His visage is square and not too bony, the upper jaw level with the lower and not protruding. His nose you would call, if anything, rather thick. His gleaming eyes are deep-set and neither absolutely round nor unduly long, and of moderate size. His brow is of the right size his forehead square and slightly hollowed from the center, and over its lower part, towards the eyebrows and nose, there hangs a sort of cloud, and from the top of his forehead down to his nose there runs a ridge of hairs sloping outwards. His head is of moderate size, his neck of due length and broad in proportion, with a tawny mane upon it, which is neither stiff and bristly, nor yet too closely curled. About the clavicles he is supple and not too tightly articulated. His shoulders are stalwart, his chest powerful, his trunk broad, with sides and back to match. There is no superfluity of flesh on his haunches or thighs. His legs are powerful and sinewy, his gait vigorous, his whole frame well knit and sinewy, and neither too stiff nor too soft. He moves slowly with a large stride, rolling his shoulders as he goes. Such is his bodily appearance, and in soul he is generous and liberal, proud and ambitious yet gentle and just and affectionate to his comrades. The panther, on the other hand, of all animals accounted brave, approximates more closely to the feminine type, save in its legs, which it uses to perform any feat of strength. For its face is small, its mouth large, its eyes small and white, set in a hollow, but rather flat in themselves. Its forehead is too long and tends to be curved rather than flat near the ears. Its neck too long and thin. Its chest narrow and its back long. Haunches and thighs fleshy. 
flanks and abdomen rather flat, its color blotchy, and its whole body ill-articulated and ill-proportioned. Such is its bodily aspect, and in soul it is mean and thievish, and in a word a beast of low cunning. I have now described the more notable examples of the male and the female types of body to be found among animals accounted brave, and the characterization of the remainder will present no difficulty. I will next proceed to explain in a chapter on selection of signs what marks derived from animals the student of physiognomics should take into consideration. Chapter 6. The Accepted Doctrines of the Semiotics of Human Character are as follows. A large and shapely foot, well articulated and sinewy, is held to signify a strong character. For evidence we are referred to the male sex in general. A small, narrow, ill-articulated foot, pretty but weak, signifies a soft character, as in the female sex. Curved toes are a sign of impudence, and so are curved nails. On the evidence of birds with curved claws, whilst toes that are not properly divided indicate timidity, as in web-footed water-birds. Ankles, sinewy, and well articulated mark a strong character on the evidence of the male sex. Fleshy and ill articulated ankles a soft character on the evidence of the female sex. When the lower leg is at once well articulated and sinewy and stalwart, it signifies a strong character as in the male sex. When it is thin and sinewy, it signifies loquacity, as in birds. When it is full and almost bursting, it signifies, by congruity, blatant effrontery. Knock knees are a sign of the pathic, by congruity. Thighs, bony and sinewy, indicate a strong character, as in the male sex but when bony and full, a soft character, as in females. Buttocks, pointed and bony, are a mark of a strong character, as in males. Fat, fleshy buttocks, of a soft character, as in females. Whilst lean buttocks, which look as if they had been rubbed bare, are indicative of a mischievous disposition, as in apes. A narrow waist marks the hunter, as in the lion, and you will find that the best hunting dogs also are narrow in the waist. A loose build round the belly indicates strength of character, as in the male sex, whilst the opposite is by congruity indicative of a soft character, a well-sized and sturdy back marks strength, and a narrow, feeble back, softness of character, as in males and females respectively. Strong sides indicate strength, and weak sides softness, as in males and females respectively, whilst swollen, inflated sides signify aimless loquacity, as in frogs. When the distance from navel to infrasternal notch exceeds that from the notch to the neck, it is a mark of gluttony and of dullness of sense, of gluttony because there is so large a receptacle of food, and of dull sense because the seat of the senses is correspondingly confined and compressed by the receptacle of food so that the senses have become stupefied by repletion of the stomach, rather than, as is usual, 
by inanition. A large, well-articulated chest signifies strength of character as in males. When the upper part of the back is large and well-covered with flesh and well-knit, the character is strong as in males. When it is feeble and gaunt and ill-knit, the character is soft as in females. When it is very much bent and the shoulders fall in upon the chest, it is argued by congruity to signify a mischievous disposition, since the front parts of the body, which ought to stand clear to view, become invisible. When it is curved backwards, it signifies vanity and lack of intelligence, as in the horse. So it must not be either convex or concave, and something intermediate between these extremes, therefore, should be looked for as marking a man of good natural parts. When the shoulders and the back of the neck are well articulated, they signify a strong character, whilst weak and ill-articulated shoulders signify a soft character, the reference being to the sexes, as I explained when speaking of feet and thighs. Supple shoulders signify liberality of soul, the argument being based on the external appearance with which liberality seems to be congruous. On the other hand, stiff, clumsy shoulders indicate an illiberal disposition, also by congruity. Suppleness of the clavicles signifies quickness of perception, for when the collarbone is supple, stimulation of the senses is rendered easy. Contrarywise, a stiff collarbone indicates dullness of sense, because then it is difficult to apprehend sense stimuli. A thick neck indicates a strong character, as in males, a thin neck weakness, as in females, a neck thick and full, fierce temper, as in bulls, a well-sized neck, not too thick, a proud soul, as in lions, a long, thin neck, cowardice, as in deer, an unduly short neck, a treacherous disposition, as in wolves, lips thin and pendulous at their points of junction, such that part of the upper lip overhangs the lower at the corners, signify pride of soul. The reference generally given is to the lion, but you may see the same thing as well in large and powerful breeds of dogs. Lips thin and hard, with a prominence about the eye-teeth, are a sign of base breeding on the evidence of swine. Thick lips with the upper overhanging the lower mean folly as in the ass and the ape. Projecting upper lip and gums mark the railer on the evidence of dogs. A nose broad at the tip means laziness as witness cattle but if thick from the tip it means dullness of sense, as in swine. If the tip is pointed, irascibility, as in dogs, whilst a round, blunt tip indicates pride, as in lions. Men with a nose, thin at the tip, have the characteristics of birds. When such a nose curves slightly, right away from the forehead, it indicates impudence, as in ravens. But when it is strongly aquiline and demarcated from the forehead by a well-defined articulation, it indicates a proud soul, as in the eagle. And when it is hollow, with the part next the forehead rounded and the curve rising upwards, it signifies lasciviousness, as in cocks. A snub nose means lasciviousness, as in deer. 
open nostrils are a sign of fierce temper, for they enter into the facial expression of temper. The face, when fleshy, indicates laziness, as in cattle. If gaunt, assiduity, and if bony, cowardice, on the analogy of asses and deer. A small face marks a small soul, as in the cat and the ape. A large face means lethargy, as in asses and cattle. So the face must be neither large nor little. An intermediate size is therefore best. A mean-looking face signifies by congruity an illiberal spirit. As to the eyes, when the lower lids are pendulous and baggy, you may know a bibulous fellow, for heavy drinking produces bagginess below the eyes. But when the upper lids are baggy and hang over the eyes, that signifies somnolence, for on first waking from sleep our upper lids hang heavily. Small eyes mean a small soul, by congruity, and on the evidence of the ape. Large eyes lethargy, as in cattle. In a man of good natural parts, therefore, the eyes will be neither large nor small. Hollow eyes mean villainy, as in the ape. Protruding eyes, imbecility, by congruity, and as in the ass. The eyes, therefore, must neither recede nor protrude. An intermediate position is best. When the eyes are slightly deep-set, they signify a proud soul, as in lions, and, when a little deeper still, gentleness, as in cattle. A small forehead means stupidity, as in swine. Too large a forehead, lethargy, as in cattle. A round forehead means dullness of sense, as in the ass. A somewhat long and flat forehead, quickness of sense, as in the dog. A square and well-proportioned forehead is a sign of a proud soul, as in the lion. A cloudy brow signifies self-will, as in the lion and the bull. A taut brow is taken from observation to mark the flatterer, and you may notice how a dog's brow smooths out when he fawns upon you. So a cloudy brow indicating self-will and a smooth brow obsequiousness, the proper condition must be intermediate between these extremes. A scowling brow means a morose disposition, for we observe that vexation is thus expressed. A downcast brow means querulousness, as may also be verified by observation. A large head means quickness, and a small head dullness of sense, on the evidence of the dog and the ass respectively. A peaked head means impudence, as in those birds which have curved claws. Men with small ears have the disposition of monkeys, those with large ears the disposition of asses, and you may notice that the best breeds of dogs have ears of moderate size. Too black a hue marks the coward, as witness Egyptians and Ethiopians, and so does also too white a complexion, as you may see from women. So the hue that makes for courage must be intermediate between these extremes. A tawny color indicates a bold spirit, as in lions, but too ruddy a hue marks a rogue, as in the case of the fox. A pale, mottled hue signifies cowardice, for that is the color one turns in terror. 
the honey pale are cold, and coldness means immobility, and an immobile body means slowness. A red hue indicates hastiness, for all parts of the body on being heated by movement turn red. A flaming skin, however, indicates mania, for it results from an overheated body, and extreme bodily heat is likely to mean mania. A fiery color on the chest signifies irascibility, for it is part of the expression of the onset of anger. Swollen veins on the neck and temples also signify irascibility, being part of the expression of anger. A face that reddens easily marks a bashful man, for blushing is an expression of bashfulness. But when the jowl goes red, you have a drunkard, for a red jowl is an expression of heavy drinking, whilst eyes that flush red indicate uncontrollable temper, for in a wild outburst of temper the eyes flush red. If the eyes are too black, they signify cowardice, for we saw above that this is the signification of too black a hue. If they are not too black, but inclining to chestnut, they indicate a bold spirit. Gray or white eyes indicate cowardice, for we saw above that this is the signification of a white hue. But if they are gleaming rather than gray, they mean a bold spirit, as in lions and eagles. Goatish eyes mean lustfulness, as in goats fiery eyes, impudence, as in dogs. Eyes pale and mottled, cowardice, for in terror the eyes go pale, with splotches of color. Glistening eyes, lasciviousness, on the analogy of the cock and the raven. Hairy legs mean lasciviousness, as in goats. Too much hair on breast and belly means lack of persistence, as argued from birds, in which this bodily characteristic is most developed. But breasts, too devoid of hair, indicate impudence, as in women. So, both extremes are bad, and an intermediate condition must be best. Hairy shoulders mean lack of persistence, on the analogy of birds, too much hair on the back, impudence, as in wild beasts. Hair on the nape of the neck indicates liberality, as in lions. Hair on the point of the chin, a bold spirit, on the evidence of dogs. Eyebrows that meet signify moroseness by congruity, Eyebrows that droop on the nasal and rise on the temporal side, silliness, as is seen in swine. When the hair of the hand stands up stiff, it signifies cowardice by congruity, for fright as well as cowardly disposition makes the hair stand on end, and very woolly hair also signifies cowardice as may be seen in Ethiopians. Thus, extremely bristly and extremely woolly hair alike signify cowardice, and so hair gently curling at the end will make for boldness of spirit, as is to be seen in lions. A ridge of hair on the upper part of the forehead indicates a liberal disposition, as in the lion but a growth of hair on the forehead down by the nose indicates illiberality, the argument being from congruity, because such a growth presents a servile appearance. A long and slow step indicates a mind slow to begin, but persistent when started, 
for the length of the stride shows determination, but its slowness procrastination. A short, slow step means tardiness without persistence, for shortness and slowness do not indicate determination. A long, quick step means enterprise and persistence, for its speed indicates enterprise and its length determination. A short, quick step signifies enterprise without persistence. Identical references are made about gesture of hand, elbow, and arm. To hold one's shoulders straight and stiff, and roll them as one walks, signifies a vainglorious spirit, on the analogy of the horse. But to roll the shoulders, if one stoops a little forwards, means a proud soul, as in the lion. To walk with feet and legs bent out means effeminacy, as being a characteristic of women. To keep turning and bending the body is a sign of obsequiousness, for that is the gesture of the flatterer. To walk with a stoop to the right is, by congruity of appearance, held to argue a pathic. Mobile eyes signify keenness and rapacity, as in hawks. Blinking eyes, cowardice, for flight begins with the eyes. Sidelong, leering glances are held to be characteristic of a fop, and so are drooping movements of one lid half over a motionless eye, and an upward roll of the eyes under the upper lids, with a tender gaze and drooping eyelids, and, in general, all tender, melting glances. We argue, partly from congruity, partly from the fact that these looks are common in women. A slow movement of the eyes, which allows a tinge of white to show all the time, so that they look stationary, indicates a reflective character, for when the mind is absorbed in reflection, our eyes also are motionless. A big, deep voice indicates insolence, as in the ass, a voice which, starting low, rises to a high pitch, indicates despondency and querulousness, the argument being partly from cattle and partly from congruity. Shrill, soft, broken tones mark the speech of the pathic, for such a voice is found in women and is congruous with the pathic's nature. A deep, hollow, simple voice signifies a noble soul, as in the stronger breeds of dogs, and also by the argument from congruity. A soft, languid voice means gentleness, as in sheep. A shrill, shrieking voice, lewdness, as in goats. Men of abnormally small stature are hasty, for the flow of their blood having but a small area to cover its movements are too rapidly propagated to the organ of intelligence. Men of abnormally large stature, on the other hand, are slow, for the flow of the blood has to cover a large area, and its movements are therefore propagated to the organ of intelligence slowly. Small men with dry tissues or of the hue that heat produces in the body, have not persistence enough to affect their purposes. For their blood flowing in a confined space, and at the same time, in consequence of the fiery condition of the body, flowing rapidly, their thought never keeps to a single topic, but is always passing to something new before being done with the old. Again, Big men with moist tissues, 
or of the hue that results from cold, also lack persistence. For their blood flowing over a large area, and slowly on account of the cold condition of the body, its movement does not manage to reach the organ of intelligence entire. On the other hand, small men with moist tissues and of the hue that results from cold do affect their purposes, for their blood moving in a confined area, the less mobile constituent in its composition produces a proportion which conduces to effectiveness. And again, big men with dry tissues and of the hue that results from heat are also persistent and are keen of sense, for the warmth of tissue and complexion counteracts the excessive size so that a proportion conducive to effectiveness is attained. Such, then, are the conditions under which opposite extremes of stature tend now to effective activity and now to ineffectiveness. But a stature intermediate between these extremes confers upon its possessors the greatest acuity of sense and the greatest general effectiveness, for, on the one hand, movements of the blood, not having a long distance to travel, easily reach the reason, while, on the other hand, not being confined in too small a space, they do not pass beyond their mark. Thus, the greatest tenacity of purpose and the greatest acuity of sense will be found in persons of moderate stature. An ill-proportioned body indicates a rogue, the argument being partly from congruity and partly from the female sex. But if bad proportions mean villainy, a well-proportioned frame must be characteristic of upright men and brave. Only the standard of the right proportions must be sought in the good training and good breeding of the body, and not in the male type, as determined at the beginning of this treatise. It is advisable, in elucidating all the signs I have mentioned, to take into consideration both their congruity with various characters and the distinction of the sexes, which is, as I showed, the most complete distinction, the male being more upright and courageous, and in short, altogether better than the female. It will be found, moreover, in every selection of signs, that some signs are better adapted than others to indicate the mental character behind them. The clearest indications are given by signs in certain particularly suitable parts of the body. The most suitable part of all is the region of the eyes and forehead, head, and face. Next to it comes the region of the chest and shoulders, and next again that of the legs and feet, whilst the belly and neighboring parts are of least service to physiognomics. In a word, the clearest signs are derived from those parts in which intelligence is most manifest. End of chapter 6 and end of Physiognomonica.